So welcome to the, the session on uh, Careers in Africa Employer of Choice, the session that almost never was. Um, it was meant to be part of the Talent Agenda Series Southern Africa Conference, which happened two weeks ago, and I hear was great. Um, uh, but this session originally was on the agenda, then it was taken out of the agenda because I was too unreliable about being able to get to South Africa. And I've since had to postpone it a couple of times for being uh, ill and then being in a maternity unit, welcoming the birth of, um, of my first child into the world. So uh, now we're here though, so I'm delighted to, to be welcoming you again to the session, obviously welcoming you for the first time that you've heard me welcome you, but I have done this before and it was better when I did it the first time. But anyway, we'll press on with the session. So it's going to take us about an hour to go through some data from the Careers in Africa Employer of Choice survey. Um, we'll fit in some time for some questions, although I really hope that we explain it well enough that you don't feel the need to ask any. But if you do, we'll be there answering them. Now, the first question that we normally get about when we produce this, this Careers in Africa Employer of Choice survey is something along the lines of, aren't you the guys who run the summits? And that is true. We are part of the company that runs Careers in Africa and runs the summits. But um, in the 15 years that we've been producing summits and attracting um, top African professionals to, to apply for jobs with leading employers, we've also built up a vast pool of data on what people are looking for. And so in addition to um, the Careers in Africa summits and in addition to the conferences that, that I mentioned at the start where this session was originally going to take place and also in addition to GCC search, our executive search business, we've got um, the Careers in Africa Employer of Choice survey which started about two years ago and it focuses just on um, what motivates and what drives African professionals to apply for jobs and to stay with employers and we produced this survey um, in association with Willis Towers Watson who've been doing it with us since the beginning. Um, they provide a lot of the, the platform that it runs on, they provide um, a lot of the, the sort of integrity behind the research and the methodology and we're really responsible for connecting that, um, that methodology with the world of African talent through our Careers in Africa database. And so the presentation today, we titled it 10 Things I HR About You and that's a, an homage to 90s romantic comedies. It's Isadora's idea to do this, I don't endorse it in, in any way. Um, here are some reviews of the session. Um, one of these reviews is actually the feedback that I received for my um, for one of my exam papers when I was at university. You can see if you can guess which one that is. Um, I feel like the the because I'm so tired this morning. I feel like we're going to be mostly getting feedback in the first category about me being a bit mumbly and nobody understanding what I'm saying. But hopefully it'll be a bit better than that. We're going to skip over this because Isadora is going to play a game show at the end, but she's going to do it herself. So. We're not going to um, we're not going to be inviting participants to the game show today. I think the technology would creak a little bit if we tried to host a live game show across continents via this webinar platform. I'm not that confident in it, so we're just going to do it here from from Studio GCC. Um, but to give you a bit of background into the data that we're going to be looking at today, uh, the Careers in Africa Employer Choice Study, as I sort of mentioned a little bit. Uh, covers attraction drivers, it covers salary and function data, it covers organizational culture data, it covers what people are looking for in leaders and managers, um, it covers the idea of total reward and EVP and we gather data from a pool of talent that spans the continent. So this is really a continent-wide survey. Um, every year that we run it we've had representation from every single one of the, the 54 um, countries across Africa. Obviously there's some disparity in, in, in the numbers, that, so we've got a lot, you know, a lot more Nigerian, Ghanaian, Kenyan, Angolan, South African applicants than we have um, people from Comoros, for example, and you wouldn't believe how difficult it is actually to tick off um, something like Comoros in a, in a global survey like this. It's quite difficult to make sure that you get participants from everywhere, but we do do it. Um, and just to break down the, the pe kind of people who are filling in this survey, to give you an example, we are looking at a 70-30 split in terms of male-female and the question that we often get asked about this when we present it at conferences is why is your survey skewed towards um, male respondents, why don't you get more female respondents and the answer is always well that's what the African workforce looks like if you look at the split between male and female in the workforce and actually it's not just the African workforce, it's much wider than that, actually the, the sort of worldwide uh, workforce is, is skewed towards men so all the, the, the topics in the conferences that we run that focus on uh, gender diversity remain you know, particularly important um, to try and even up those numbers, but at least the survey is representative. Um, equally, 
we um, we have a good spread of respondents um, by where they're based in the world. So you see that with the stats down in the bottom left-hand corner. 70% uh, of the respondents to the survey are based where they are citizens. So these are Nigerians in Nigeria. 20% uh, of the respondents are in the diaspora, they're outside the continents at the moment. So these are Nigerians in the UK or the US. Um, and 10% of the respondents are in really the interesting group that, that people want to talk more and more about and that's really worthy of um, a bit a bit sort of further discussion and study. And that's African professionals who are mobile within the continent. So this is um, you know, African managers and leaders who are moving to open up new markets across different uh, parts of the continent that maybe um, are, are more recently open for business or more recently diversifying their economies. So this might be a Nigerian who is, I don't know, um, running a country operation in Sierra Leone. Um, previously, more of that group were South Africans who were going around doing different things, but that group's really diversified. It's also really grown. That percentage of the survey grows year on year, and they're a really interesting group to watch for anybody that's interested in uh, recruiting or retaining or the general behavior of um, internationally experienced African professionals, the ones who are building that experience by working internationally within the continent. Um, the survey is 90 odd questions, there have been 20 odd thousand respondents to it um, over the couple of years. So there's a big rich pool of data there, it's the most robust um, kind of thing of its type. Um, and that's why we're so pleased to be to be sharing some results with you today. Um, but we're trying to make this this sort of this session sort of vaguely interactive, so I want to start off by asking, asking you a question. You don't have to actually physically answer it because <laughs> there's no... Uh, the voting poll function of the, of the technology hasn't worked. So what I want you to do is imagine in your head that you're answering this question. You can answer it to yourself, answer it out loud if you want even, um, but just nobody's listening. Um, but then we show you the answers. So where is Southern African talent if it isn't at home? Just to get started with a, like a demographic question about um, the, you know, the Southern African professional um, workforce. Where is it currently based? And as Southern, I say Southern African because we were going to do this session for the, the conference based in South Africa that was covering Southern African region. Um, so we've done all of the cuts of the data for this from the survey. We've done it with a South African, sorry, Southern African uh, view. So we're only looking at the answers, the motivations, the drivers for Southern African talent today, which I should have said at the beginning, but you know now. So where is the Southern African talent pool if it isn't at home? You can make your guesses now, um, and then we'll then we'll describe it. So this is this is where it is. This is where the Southern African talent pool is, and the graph needs some explanation. So I'm up here with the the 34 percent. That is uh, the Southern African talent pool that's in South Africa. So of you know that's including some South Africans, obviously, but it's also including Zimbabweans, Zambians, Namibians who are uh, sorry, actually, no, it's not including South Africans. It's Namibians, Zimbabweans, Zambians who are based in South Africa. So the majority of Southern African professionals who are not working in their home market are working in South Africa, which is not that surprising. It's the, it's the major economy. It's drawing people in from the surrounding areas. Uh, the next biggest group are actually based in Europe. So if you're looking for Southern African professionals who are outside their home market, um, after having gone to South Africa and looked around there for those people, the next most logical place to go will be to look in Europe. And then after that, the album cover from, from Toto, so it's a single cover from Toto's Africa, is indicating that the next biggest uh, location for Southern African professionals is elsewhere in Africa. So they might be in East Africa or West Africa. Then we've got this 10% here, the, the KFC bucket. We, I don't know why we made this so abstract, it's really difficult to remember what we meant by it, but the uh, the answer is actually that that's, that's, that's representing southern hospitality, I think. So it's people based elsewhere in, in southern Africa. So this is Zimbabweans in Zambia or something like that. Uh, then you've got a smaller segment of people based in North America. You've got a smaller segment, again, the 6% up here, represented by our colleague Gani Min um, from China. There's people based in Asia. Um, that, I think, is a very small slice of a map of Middle Earth, which is the Middle East. I, I have no idea why we did it like this. We've uh, then a small 3% down in South America and 2% of the talent pool represented by Sebastian the Crab um, from Oceania, which is the worst of all of these 
so it's slightly abstract pie chart slices. So in summary, because I think you know that might have been lost in the in Southern African talent pool that isn't based at home is drawn to South Africa to the market there, followed by significant pools in Europe, uh, the rest of Africa, and an amount of professionals who are moving around Southern Africa but not in South Africa, and everything else is fairly niche. Okay, so if we were going to look at a, a talent sourcing campaign for Southern African talent as a whole, we're pretty clear that our three big hubs are South Africa, Europe, and then the rest of Africa. So we've got another little interactive vote to get you thinking. It's early in the morning. We want to wake everybody up. Um, now, when is Southern African talent most likely to want to leave a job? So this is saying we've asked people the question, how um, how likely are you to leave your job? And we've compared that to the tenure of a person's employment. So we've asked people who've been at a company for one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, six years, seven years, how likely are you to want to leave your job in the next year to two years? Does that make sense, Isadora? Yeah? Okay. We should have given you a microphone. It would be easier to do a little double act, but I just wanted to check that it was clear. Okay. So have a think about what you, uh, what you reckon the most likely, if you like. Um, and we can, we've got a graph here that's featuring uh, some stuff about sort of talent mobility and who wants to leave companies. And we'll just start off with a headline stat just to compare how likely Southern African talent in general is to be thinking about leaving employers compared to the rest of Africa. And you can see that it's pretty similar. So we've asked people the question, how likely are you to want to leave your employer? And 68% of people said, I'm fairly likely to be going uh, within the next couple of years versus 65% in Africa. It seems like a I don't know whether that seems like an extreme number or not. I'm kind of immune to it because that's what the number is and it's been pretty stable for a couple of years. But generally, a fairly significant proportion of your workforce for the right kind of offer wouldn't mind having a move at some point in the next couple of years. That's not saying they're all looking by any means, but I think there's a degree of openness there in the majority of cases. But it's no different from Southern Africa to the rest of Africa. You get a slightly bigger difference if you just look at the people who have indicated that they're most likely to go. So Southern Africa... Uh, the percentage of people who consider themselves very likely to be looking to leave, uh, 45% as opposed to the rest of Africa, then I think we can say there that there's a slightly, uh, there's a more, um, there's a significantly higher really group of people thinking about, seriously thinking about leaving their jobs in the next couple of years. That's an interesting one for people who are thinking about retaining talent in Southern Africa. And then we can map it over the tenure of the employment, which was the thing we asked originally. We were saying, how, at what point in a person's tenure with the company do you think a person's most likely to leave the organization? Or, and we map that onto the graph like this. And Southern Africa is the light green line at the top. So you can see that the Southern African flight risk over a period of time is, is slightly higher than uh, the rest of Africa, but it corresponds to the same kind of shape overall. And that's not true when we do this in all the different regions. I said before that we've done this in East Africa. Um, and you do get a different sort of graph when you look at East Africa versus Southern Africa. And what I mean by that is if you just look at the shape of the overall graph, with the exception of this little dip in the rest of Africa from a five to ten year period, um, look at the scale as well. There's not too much difference between these, these numbers. The Southern African talent pool is pretty consistent with the rest of Africa in terms of the fact that it starts off, as you'd expect, within one year of joining an employer, reasonably unlikely to want to leave becoming more likely over one to three years, kind of peaking around three to five years, and then dropping off again. Now, if you go to East Africa, you see a very different, uh, you see a very different sort of shape of graph, and it's not this kind of easy curve. It's actually a really significant uh, peak in the middle, around three to five years, and it's very, very difficult to get people to leave employers in East Africa when they've been there for a period of time. So this far, this bullet point on the right hand side about someone who's been in position for like 10 years and how likely they are to want to leave, if we do this graph in East Africa, that drops to the bottom of the axis. People do not want to leave jobs that they've been in for 10 years or so, which is, um, it gives you a different problem when you're looking at, you know, what is a healthy rate of turnover? Because we don't want to retain everybody indefinitely. Um, and there's a real sense in the respondents from East Africa that you've got some sort of tenure there um, and a question for people about how do you get the next generation through, how do you make sure you've got healthy turnover in your organisation. But for Southern Africa, it tracks pretty evenly with the rest of the continent. 
Now here's another one um, that we get a lot in conferences is the question of is the millennial generation more likely to be uh, looking to leave employers more often than people who are a little bit, uh, well not millennial. And you can see from the, the headline stat that yeah they are slightly more likely to want to leave. Um, you now we've seen that that's replicated across all of the regions. Um, there is, just trying to mute something in the background here, no idea. Okay, every market that we go to within Africa, we, we do get feedback from the you know the HRDs in these conferences. We think the millennials are more likely to be going. This is a real problem for us, and the data bears it out that the millennial talent pool is looking to leave more often. I think everybody accepts that now. Um, um, but the I think the key question that we then follow up with, and and it'd be worth I think having some some further discussion on. I don't know if anybody wants to. You could maybe chip in with some questions on this one, Isadora, if there's any at the end. But how organisations are actually dealing with um, the reality that millennials are more likely to want to leave organisations. So you can't just obviously you can't just not hire them. Um, it's a generation of the workforce. You've got to have them in the company. Um, but how do you come to how do you reconcile the fact that they're more likely to be leaving more quickly than previous generations? Do you uh, focus on knowledge transfer? Do you try and retain them? Well, the, the reality is that it's pretty difficult. Um, so you're trying to change somebody's sort of standing in front of the, the oncoming tide and, and just holding up your hand. Um, or, or do you yeah, do you focus on knowledge transfer solutions? Do you do you change your perception of what retention needs to look like for this generation? Um, some interesting things, I think, to have some questions about if there are any later. Um, and then the last thing about talent mobility that we wanted to just show is this graph here on... Um, which other demographic is having a material impact on people's likeliness to want to leave an organization. So starting from the left, this uh, little icon here, the red one, is representing a uh, sector. The icon in the middle is representing location of talent, so that's diaspora versus not the diaspora. And the icon on the right is, is representing gender. And the question we're asking here is, which of these three demographic cuts makes a material difference to people's likeliness to leave an organization. So as we saw, millennials are more likely than other groups. One of these groups is more likely to be thinking about leaving the organization than the others. Uh, um, so have a think about which one you think that is. You know which one it is, Isadora? Yes? Okay. Is the gender, is the, is the one um, that makes a material difference. So when we look at, across sectors, are, are people more likely to leave an organization? It doesn't matter whether you're in construction or in IT. It has no impact. It doesn't matter whether you're in the diaspora or locally based, it has no impact, but it has a significant impact if you are a woman. Um, and I think there's some really interesting, when we do these in conferences, we can then throw this into another session to look at the answer to. But questions around gender diversity in the same way that we raised um, the point that at the beginning of the survey that the respondents to this is sort of 70% male, 30% female, because that's reflective of the market. Um, when we look at likeliness to leave an organization, we think about what employers can do to ensure that women can um, can feel supported and feel able to progress within organisations when they go through things like um, you know the decision to to raise a family or how they're interacting with their leaders and managers, which are the uh, the key factor in often in people leaving organisations. And I think the fact that we've got a significant increase uh, in the number of women who are likely to leave organisations as opposed to the number of men likely to leave organisations. Um, it raises the question about what we're doing in organisations um, to make women feel like these are places that they can stay and grow over a period of time. Um, potentially another webinar with somebody who knows a lot more about gender diversity solutions than I do. Um, so another question. Now where is uh, the talent pool looking for its opportunities? And this one's one for the talent acquisition professionals. So which one of these channels is the most popular place for people to look for uh, job opportunities? And this is people, again, who are from one of the Southern African markets. Um, here's the answer. So you can see the big spikes on here, the job sites, um, company websites and news are the, are the big spikes. And you can also see from the green to the gray that these are the ones where Southern Africa, they're more important than the rest of Africa. Um, other, not sure what that is, but it, nobody picked it. Uh, social media, more important than the rest of Africa than it is in Southern Africa. Uh, word of mouth referrals from friends, more important in other markets than in Southern Africa, but job sites, company websites and the news 
or our three key channels for Southern Africa. I think you've still got to include social media and uh, word of mouth referrals because they're powerful drivers, but not as much in Southern Africa as elsewhere. And the circle that's on here, you might, you know, the sharpest uh, statistical minds will have noticed that that circle seems to be in a slightly unusual place for, for Southern Africa. The reason the circle is where it is is because that kind of covers the um, the the key channels when we look at this from an East African point of view. So if we were looking at East Africa, uh, social media much more important, um, referrals from friends much more important, and job sites drops right down there, as does um, as does uh, as does the company site. So you can see from a talent attraction point of view, you've got a different behaviour, a different place that people are going looking uh, for their opportunities. And for for those of you who are, I'm not sure I can see the attendee list, so I don't know who are recruiters among the audience. Um, but if you are a recruiter um, and maybe you have a Pan-African remit, it's an interesting one to consider how you mix those channels up in Southern Africa versus in, say, uh, West Africa or East Africa, where you should have a, a greater focus in your in your mix, according to this data anyway, uh, on the job sites and what you're projecting through your company site and, and through the news um, than in a different market. Now. Here's another question, which I think is quite an interesting one. Again, not sure who the attendees are in this session, but this one looks at um, which type of brands are attracting talent, and it splits brands, employer brands, into types according to who are global multinationals versus who are African uh, indigenous companies that are multinational within Africa uh, versus local companies who are active in one or two markets. So in this one, we asked talent, uh, would you rather work for um, an international multinational would you rather work for an African company that's active across um, multiple markets, or would you rather work for a company that's only uh, present in one or two local markets? And here's the answer. So you can see that, um, let me just explain the way the graph is laid out. You've got uh, the green uh, figures are the diaspora versus local for the rest of Africa, not Southern Africa. The purple and the pink figures are the diaspora versus local for Southern Africa only. And you can see that Southern Africa has a reasonably big uh, difference from, from the rest of Africa and a big swing towards the African multinationals. So this is people who are rejecting, uh, for example, I think rejecting is a bit harsh, but they're more likely in Southern Africa to pick uh, Tiger Brands over a Unilever than they are to pick um, uh, an EABL over a Unilever in a different market. For example, uh, we can see in general that local companies find it really hard to get traction in the talent pool versus multinationals um, in general, which I think is something that's pretty obvious, but it's a, certainly a challenge for those SMEs. Um, and then obviously that the bigger than SMEs, sort of indigenous major companies, major banks, major power companies who've got to compete with multinationals from an employer brand point of view. And there are some big questions around, you know, what can these companies do? Um, to project an employer brand that's going to bring people into the organization when uh, the Unilevers, when the Microsofts have got giant global brands behind them, global employer brands, um, and all these kind of resources that they've got to fight against. Um, what we sort of say is that the opportunity to be specific with a brand can counter um, the, uh, can counteract the degree um, to which the global kind of resources of a brand are um, are skewing people to go and look at it. So, for example, if you're if you're a Tanzanian bank, um, you can um, be very clear about how your employer value proposition um, makes you a great employer in Tanzania. So, you can be very specific about compensation. You can be very specific about working conditions. You can be very specific about health benefits or retirement benefits that work in that context. Whereas um, a global multinational is, is less likely to be able to do that. And that's your opportunity to compete effectively. Having said that, the advantage is very much with, uh, with the majors. Um, that big difference in Southern Africa, which is the swing from um, kind of international multinationals to African multinationals, you can see it here with the, the pink and the purple, the difference from, from those to the, to the graphs above. While the, the international multinationals are still the most popular choice, African multinationals are more popular in Southern Africa than they are anywhere else on the continent. And the reason for that is largely that um, Southern Africa is home to some of the strongest African multinational brands. So the examples are pretty obvious, the MTNs, 
um, the Tiger brands, the the old mutual standard banks. These are these are brands that that people associate with um, strongly with Southern Africa. They're high performers, and that trends bared out in other markets. When we did this in East Africa, here you can see that East Africa too has a slightly higher um, incidence of, of people wanting to work for African multinationals. Um, in the same way that Southern Africa does, because it's got powerful brands there like Safaricom and EABL um, that people can be attracted to. Um, so it goes to show that it's really a lot to do with the size of the brand from a commercial point of view, as well as what people are saying specifically about the employer brand that's attracting people to want to work for these companies. So we really do need to think about how we um, make employer brands distinct from commercial brands, because for the majority of employers, um, certainly all local employers, it doesn't make sense to get into a kind of commercial brand fight for talent because you're going to lose to, to bigger brands. So this is a quick snapshot. Now we, we produce a set of awards every year around who are the employers of choice. And what we've done here is just present for you um, the 30 most popular employers among the Southern African talent pool in this survey. Now, when we produce the awards, we use a kind of complicated methodology, actually, that combines um, sort of popularity with forced ranking of one employer over another. So, obviously, by that we mean um, pick, pick, do you want to work for Unilever or Tiger Brands? Um, and it also combines it with um, some deep ratings of different employer um, attractiveness drivers. Um, and people's perception of those within the company. So, asking the question, how do you how do you feel about the training opportunities at McKinsey, for example? And we combine all of that into an employer choice award. All we've done here, um, just for your sort of interest today, is say, who, which are the most popular employers? If we say to people, who do you want to work for? Just like that, nice and popular. What uh, what answers do we get back? And you can see that we get some of those African multinationals that we talked about, some of those strong Southern African companies are featuring. Uh, we also get one or two really big sort of local organizations that's at Parastatos like Eskom are on here. Um, and we get a number of those large multinationals, the international firms that are still the most popular choices. Um, there's significant difference from region to region when you do this. So you don't by any means get the same set of 30 brands if you look at the top 30 in each region. Um, although you will see sort of 10 or 12 usual suspects, the African Development Bank, Unilever, MTN, KPMG, McKinsey uh, will be popular wherever you go. Um, and another thing just to think about in terms of how um, sort of employer popularity works, even though this is the top 30 out of 500 brands that were featured, the top brand has I think eight times the popularity of the 30th place brand in this. So there's a big, there's a significant difference between um, how popular the most popular brand is versus the least popular. Um, if you want to guess at, at which is the most popular employer brand in Africa, um, I'll give you the answer to that now if you're, if you're interested. The most popular employer brand in Africa is the World Bank and it has been consistently for a couple of years now. Um, and it's, it's, it's really interesting how the World Bank, how African Development Bank, how DBSA, how organizations like this are capturing um, the attention of African talent, and that's not just split. It's not just you know people in the diaspora who want to come back, and make a difference. That's people locally based who are driving this as well. So these organisations have got really significant pull on the continent, um, and it's interesting to think about how um, the sort of development story plays a part in that, but also how their um, excellent sort of compensation and benefits plays a part in that. Um, how the retirement benefits, health benefits, all this stuff plays a part in making these organisations particularly attractive across the continent because you would get the World Bank coming out of the top of the rankings wherever you ask this question within Africa and coming out of the top by a fair distance. Uh, let's skip over that because we haven't really got the time. No, let's do it. All right, so we this is just one to think about for yourselves again where you um, where you sit on the graph. And the principle here is that having looked at you know brand popularity, having looked at the importance of telling a specific story in a certain market, um, we then try and connect that into the recruitment process. So employer brand obviously has been around for, I don't know, 20 years or so, people talking about this, and EVP for slightly less time, but these are all really established concepts. And what we see within, within careers in Africa and within GCC search is, though, that it's still taking time for, uh, for some of these concepts to really take root 
in things like the talent attraction uh, process. So what we mean by that is um, it's difficult to see on a consistent basis a lot of brands across Africa a promoting a, an employer value proposition that is specific to the markets that they want to attract talent in. So a lot of the time people are coming to market with a global proposition. It's not being segmented even at a continent wide level. But it's really not appropriate to talk about segmentation at a continent wide level because each region, each market within each region is so different. So if you, you, you sort of follow that down the chain and you've got an inherited global employer brand that wouldn't be fit for purpose if it was used on a if it was specific on an Africa wide basis being used in 54 different markets. Um, so even though everybody's aware of the importance of employer brand, the importance of employer value proposition, very few brands have really cracked um, being able to communicate what they offer to people within individual markets. So when we go to Angola, for example, and we see that health insurance is much more important to people there as an attraction driver than it is in any other market, what are employers in Angola able to do to communicate that uh, great health insurance is part of what they offer to, to talent um, compared to what, they, what they're what they just telling everybody anywhere else in the world. Um, and that's a really specific way of looking at it. I mean, you, you've got a much more crude way of looking at it when you're just talking about, you know, when we're, when we're using um, communications to promote an employer brand, do we, um, are we seeing like people who realistically look like they're from these markets? Um, are we just seeing, yeah. I've lost count of the number of times we've looked at um, uh, offshore drilling companies, for example, who are marketing their opportunities in Africa with pictures of rigs in the North Sea staffed by Norwegian guys. Um, and they put these banners at the top of, of job posts and say, you know, come work for us in, um, in, the, in the Gulf of Guinea. It's crazy. Um, and so the second part of it, in addition to um, looking at whether you're making an employer brand specific is also whether your recruiters and talent attraction uh, professionals are using EVP um, material and employer brand material um, to influence what they're saying in their recruitment communications. So if we know that it's important to um, to promote a segmented employer brand across um, across different markets, you know, when we actually get to the point of writing job posts or writing adverts. Of, of running recruitment campaigns and featuring banners on different websites, are we carrying that segmented message through? And so, with this graph, we're asking people: Are you um, are you doing a joined-up segmented proposition um, where you are ensuring that your employer brand is fit for purpose in the market and that it's coming through in all the touch points of your recruitment and talent acquisition communications? Because we think that that's the target to go for, and that. The vast majority of organisations have got some work to do to, to travel that distance. Now you might find that you are um, currently applying a global thing with no direction to, to recruiters about how to position the employer brand through the touch points, which is probably the other end of the scale. Um, I know there's a lot more organisations who are at that point in the cycle than have really reached the, the zenith of, of talking about um, value propositions that matter in Africa and communicating those through all the touch points of the recruitment process. Um, so, most of you signed up, I think, to get uh, access just to the data on um, which attraction drivers uh, matter the most to people, so that you can think about how you position those in recruitment communications. And we've kind of made your way to the end for that, because we thought that the other stuff was interesting. But please, uh, feel free, if you did stuff was interesting, to just tell us next time to skip to the numbers and cut out the nonsense. Um, but what we're going to show you here is a list of all the attraction drivers that were in the survey. Um, and how relatively important or unimportant they were. And just before we do go into that, we're just showing you this graph. Um, the reason we're, we're hiding it is that there's a little bit of a game to play, so it's a bit more interactive to reveal the numbers. But what we wanted to show you how there's a difference um, in how important different attraction drivers are to different groups of people. So what we were saying about not having a one-size-fits-all value proposition. If you look down the, the left-hand column here, the, the column that's labeled diaspora, this is the ranking of all the drivers for the Southern African diaspora. The drivers are behind the big confidential sticker. Um, over on the right is the, the ranking of the drivers to, the, to, to talent that's based locally. And then you've got the variation over on the right hand side. And you can see that your, your key drivers, even things that are up in the top two or three, whilst you've got some consistency between different markets, you've also got some drivers that matter um, very much more to certain groups than to other groups. And so you've got to ask the question, you know, if we're going to 
promote opportunities. Let's say we're going to run a diaspora recruitment campaign, which a lot of people do, and we've done a lot of them for, for careers in Africa. You're going to want to know what those key drivers are to be part of your messaging um, for the diaspora and how it needs to be different from what you're talking about in local markets. And this driver that's there, number three on the list, I'll tell you what that one is just to, to illustrate it. That's the importance of challenging work to talent. And you see that difference from the diaspora to the local markets across every single region, actually, with challenging work. Um, the big difference there is, is that you're talking to the diaspora versus local talent. And if you want to attract the diaspora to come and work in your operations across various African markets, um, the importance of telling them that you've got real challenging work for them is key. So whether their perception is, is, is right or wrong, and, and we, we have conversations uh, a lot of the time in the Talent Agenda series about what's the perception of the diaspora and have they got realistic expectations and all the rest of it. But they really want to feel like they're going to be challenged. Um, they don't want to come back and work uh, in Africa if that means that they are not going to be at the cutting edge. And there's no reason that they shouldn't be at the cutting edge with you know, fantastic um, digital developments across kind of all forms of African business, with some of the most difficult environments to do other types of business like mining or, or drilling or something like that, you can be challenged, uh, absolutely. But there is this kind of reticence to come back without that challenge among the diaspora, and it's important that if you want to attract them as an employer, you're talking about that. So this little slide we're just using to, to show that some drivers are much more important to certain groups than they are to others. But now let's go and look at the data and pick out what those most important drivers are. And we're going to do that via the medium of the game show. Uh, we have a game show called Play Your HRs, right, that we do live at the conferences. Yeah, and Isadora is going to join us and, and play it on the phone. This is going to be like a radio phoning. We've got Isadora, she's going to play it. Because we've only got Isadora and nobody else um, doing it and dialed in, it means that um, even if you get it wrong, we're going to pretend she didn't get it wrong and just let her carry on. Um, but then you still get the learning outcome which is the most important thing, the only important thing uh, about this, okay, because there's no prize for you as a door, you just got to play um, okay. without any incentive, okay, and the way the game works is that we show you an attraction driver, in this case the opportunity to learn new skills, and we ask you um, uh, to look at the next driver that comes up and tell us whether that driver is going to be more or less important than the one that you're already looking at. So we'll, we'll walk you through the first one, Isadora, and then we'll get going live, okay? And everybody else, uh, feel free to, to join in on the chat, whether you think it's going to be higher or lower, and we'll keep an eye on it. And the person who looks like they got the most stuff right will work it out at the end and send you a free conference ticket or something. I'm not sure how we're going to do that, but we'll find a way to do it. Um, so opportunities to learn new skills um, was rated at, I got a number 74 on this rating scale. What is this rating scale, you say? Well, we asked people out of 10 how important each driver was. So we didn't ask them out of 10 this year, we changed it. We had a, a pool of 100 coins, 100 sort of mythical coins um, that we gave to every survey respondent and we said, out of all the attraction drivers that there are, allocate your 100 coins. You can put 100 coins onto one thing or you can spread them evenly amongst everything or you can do anything in between that. You don't have to give coins to every driver at all. So it really gave people um, the challenge of saying, how much do you want to invest in all these different drivers? You can't just say everything is 10 out of 10 important, which is a way that we've done it in the past. And you do tend to see that people, surprisingly enough, they, they, they quite like good things. So they have a tendency to go, yeah, that's important, that's important, that's important, that's important, that's important. Yeah, we know. But now we make people choose. Okay. So the 74 is the coin value that was attached to opportunity to learn new skills. So you, you can't say whether it's going to be higher or low without seeing what the next one is. This is a door you need, to, you, need to, you need to look at. And also they can't hear you if you're just pointing downwards. All right? The next one is uh, make an impact. So this is the opportunity to make an impact on an organization versus the opportunity to learn new skills. Is Adora, what's more important? Make an impact. Make an impact more important. Okay. Let's see, let's see if you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. Don't put the phone down and dance, pick the phone up and, and, and keep talking into it. Um, we should do this on webcam, it would be interesting for people. Um, so make an impact versus the next driver we've got which is mission visional values. So is make an impact more important than mission visional values? 
make an impact. Make an impact you think is more important. Okay, interesting one because when people look at employer brands, a lot of people will go to, okay, what do we stand for? This is important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're right, it's much more important that people feel they've got the opportunity to make an impact within the organization than that they agree with the mission, the vision, and the values. Make an impact is, in fact, the second most important attraction driver in this entire thing. So, uh, and when you see the previous slide that the it was the number two was the same for the local versus the diaspora talent. Make an impact is pretty much everybody's number one or number two across the continent. So if your employer value proposition in Africa doesn't say you will have the opportunity to make an impact, if your communications don't say that, you're probably missing out on applicants because it's pretty important. All right, mission, vision, and values versus challenging work. Which one's more important? Okay. It should be challenging work. I just told you that was the answer in the in the last thing. Uh, there it is, challenging work is, is the next one. You're on course to win big, Isadora, if only there was a prize. Um, now, challenging work versus uh, the opportunity to advance your career in the future. So this is where you work for an organization. Now, how much do you think it's going to impact? So let me explain for the people what the driver means before you give the answer out. Because um, remember, they hated all the, the ad lib at the beginning. And now you're just wasting more time. Right, so future advancement. If, I, if you have the brand on the CV now, does it make you more likely to get good jobs in the future? That's what we mean by that one. So is that one more important than challenging work? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it's not. It's not. It's um. It's more important to have challenging work than to uh, than to feel like a brand is going to advance your future career. So again. I don't know, we've seen a little trend here when we're looking at the employer brand uh, and the value proposition construction. We've seen that uh, mission and vision and values is much less important than can I make an impact in this job and can I be challenged in this job is more important than will this job help me in my future career. So people want to do stuff that is going to be interesting to do right now. Not so much thinking about some of the abstract or uh, long-term considerations. Anyway, future advancement versus the next one, which is trust or confidence in senior leadership. Isadora, which one's more important? Uh, future advancement. Future advancement. Why do you say that? Okay, no, not, not, not prepared to comment. Um, you're right, future advancement is the, the more important one of the two. Now, this is interesting. This one's interesting. I mentioned uh, briefly a few minutes ago that we changed the way that we ran the survey from saying to people um, how important is this rate out of 10 to here are your coins, dish them out. And the biggest difference to an attraction driver, there were two of them. I can't tell you about one of them because it's going to come up later. But leadership, trust in leadership changed dramatically when we changed that method of taking the survey. Um, and it went from being kind of the top three, top four most important drivers when you said to people, you can rate everything as high as you like. People rated trust the leadership very high. But now you make people dish out their limited number of coins and trust in leadership drops right down the uh, right down the ranking. Which is really interesting because if you look at retention drivers and how uh, important a factor is to whether people stay with a company, trust or confidence in senior leadership is the single most important factor in whether people stay with companies. So when you limit how much people can can pick when you force them to choose what they want in a job they will down prioritize having leaders and managers that they trust then when they join the organization if they don't trust the leaders and managers they will quit so you've got this sort of funny paradox where people are saying I'm not bothered about it oh wait a minute I hate it I'm leaving which is and it wasn't something that we that we saw in the in the in the survey whilst we were allowing people to rate everything as high as they liked so quite an interesting one from a recruitment communications point of view because you could read into this, it's not worth talking about because people don't prioritize it equally. People who have maybe been around a little bit, they're experienced, they know what they're looking for in an employer, they will know that the, the roles that they've had that they got the most out of were ones where they were in sync with their, their management and how much of a factor that has in whether you enjoy yourself ultimately. Okay, so trust in leadership versus having a good work-life balance. Isadora, what do you think? I think that it's a work-life balance. You think right? Yep, work-life balance, really important. Added to the survey this year to just give people a really clear way of saying how important is it to you to have something outside of the workplace and it's gone into the sort of top five drivers, really important to people to feel like they're going to have a decent work-life balance 
um, interesting one for people who are operating in like uh, hardship environments. How do you tell people that you're going to have a, a decent work-life balance if you're in, you know, the river basin, working in a pretty tricky area, not too many places you can go to. Interesting to think about how you can communicate and overcome that. Um, the, the people's interest in that traction driver. Next up, work-life balance versus job security. What's more important, Isadora? I think job security. Job security is more important. Actually, it's not, and that's surprising. Um, job security, one of the top three last year, dropped behind things like work-life balance this year. Um, and it's one job security that varies a lot from market to market. So I talked a bit before about health benefits in Angola. Job security in the last couple of years has been really important in Angola. We're near that in, in South Africa, for example. A lot less important there. And we interpret that. The reason for that is that um, you know, economic conditions in Angola in the last couple of years as a result of the barrel prices have been pretty difficult. And so getting people to come and work in those markets um, where the economy may be um, is skewed more towards something like extraction and to oil and gas. Uh, the oil and gas market in general, really keen to get job security at, at a time when there isn't a lot of job security in that market. So an interesting one to think about how how dynamic this, this process of what matters to your talent can be and how, I don't know, if I'm, if I'm in the oil and gas market, if I'm recruiting, which a lot of the time, to be honest, recently I'm not, how can I communicate that I'm able to provide security because it's important in certain markets? If I'm not in the oil and gas industry and I'm interested in taking their talent, I might be able to differentiate really effectively by promoting job security. If I know that they're all worried, how can I use that to be more competitive right now? And I wonder how many of us, when we're doing our recruitment, are able to be that dynamic in, in, in our messaging, thinking about what's mattering to people right now. Not very many. It's difficult to do. But it's interesting. I think the opportunity is pretty clear there to do that. Um, right, job security or healthcare benefits? You can't say you don't know. You need to just pick one. Um, job security. Job security. Absolutely, healthcare benefits less important. Less important. Important in certain markets. Important if you're a bit older. More important if you're a woman than if you're a man. But on balance, one of the middle of the road drivers not floating too many people's boats. And what about this one? Healthcare benefits or base pay and salary? Which one's more important? Base pay salary. You think? That's the most important driver in the survey. And this is interesting too, you know, I said earlier on that when you change the methodology and you make people give their coins, their finite number of coins to the drivers that they really, really care about if they can't care about everything, there's a big difference in how important base salary is. So when we did this last year and let people um, accord as much importance as they like to everything. Base pay ends up right in the middle of the drivers. It's like number 12 or number 13 or something out of 26 when we did it that year. This year, by a distance, it was number one, which goes to show, I think, what the conclusion that we came to last year when it came out in the middle of the drivers was base pay is like, you need it's the pay to play. You've got to do it. You've got to have that one covered if you want to be competitive in any way. And if you don't have base pay covered, you can't attract. But if you've ticked the box, because that's all it is, is a box ticking exercise, there's no opportunity really to differentiate with this. Tick the box and then you can get into making an impact, challenging work, all the things that you know make different talent pools a little bit unique and make your business a little bit unique. So it's an interesting outcome that when we force people to choose what they want, they all went, well, if you're going to force me, I do want to get paid. Well, yeah, we know. But maybe look at the drivers underneath the two or three that come in under that. Um, for the reality in terms of how to differentiate and make employer value propositions that are specific and interesting. Okay, so this is, congratulations Isadora, you're a winner by virtue of the fact that you were the only person playing, but you did do a good job, so thank you for, for taking part you're and assisting us all in, in revealing these drivers. Now let's skip to the, the, the kind of blanket thing for Southern Africa, here's the full ranking of absolutely everything. Base pay up at the top, making an impact, learning skills, work-life balance, challenging work, job security, uh, future career, great place to work. We looked at all of those. Uh, we didn't look at retirement benefits in this. As I said, it's a bit further down. So people um, definitely showed a preference within Southern Africa for more immediate stuff that impacted their day-to-day -day job. So stuff that I feel every single day when I'm working, am I making an impact? Am I learning? 
do I have a decent work-life balance? Am I being challenged? More important than stuff like healthcare benefits, because I'm not sure yet if I'm going to be ill, retirement benefits, because I can't think that far ahead, mission, vision, values, because it's too abstract. CSR as well, you know, we, we hear a fair amount about the importance of CSR from a, you know, from a traction point of view, I work for a company that cares about stuff. Mm, it's unproven, I think, that's the best that we can say about it, that it's not, it's not clear. You know, whilst it's not going to hurt to have strong CSR, people are going quite a long way down the list of drivers before they're using that as a differentiator. Yes, it will work for some people, but you know, in the limited amount of communication space and the limited amount of headspace you've got with people to tell them what you're all about, things like the company's financial performance, CSR, how innovative you are and, and your commercial brand, they're not the things that people really want to hear about. And that's quite interesting when you look at the job descriptions that we uh, we, we receive, we receive a lot of job descriptions coming through careers in Africa that we post on people's behalf and the number of times that the job description starts off with a paragraph about the company and the first sentence in that paragraph is the size of the company's turnover or similar. So when I haven't got the stat to mind, you will know it better than I do. You've got a very limited number of seconds that people are looking at things like job descriptions in the same way that there's a very limited number of seconds when you're looking at their CVs the other way. But we shouldn't really be using those seconds up talking about things like the size of our turnover, the fact that we're innovative, you know, people could care less. Okay. All right. Well, that's it for for the thing. I mean, we've got a couple of minutes. So I'll do some. I'll do. I'll, I'll respond to a couple of questions if we've got any. Um, so I'll see what we've got from Ms. Adora. And the other thing we'll do is we'll be putting this presentation. Um, and the recording of it onto the Talent Agenda Series community. Talent Agenda Series community is a new, new initiative. Um, so we've been running uh, conferences for the last two or three years. Now the community is in response to what we've heard from HR and business leaders in Africa who've said we want to be part of a conversation that lasts 365 days a year. So on the Talent Agenda Series website, we've created an area for you to join and discuss uh, these kind of things 365 days a year. There are forums there. There are um, places where you can watch content, there are videos, there are podcasts, there are recordings of webinars like this that have been cleaned up and edited to take out all the nonsense. Um, you'll also find slides of presentations like this there. And currently the Talent Agenda Series community is free to join and free to be a member of, and it will be free to be a member of um, on the current sort of participation package uh, for, for good. So I'd strongly uh, recommend that you afterwards sign up at the Talent Agenda Series community so that you can access these slides because that's the only place I'm going to put them, uh, access the recording of this, watch it back and take part in some discussions following this. Um, and I think Isadora and the team will send around a uh, direct link so that you can register for free. Okay, good. So this has been uh, 